Greetings in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Jack Chick speaking. What you are going to hear on this tape is absolutely devastating. The information and the facts we're going to present are going to change your life. Be patient with me and please listen all the way to the end of the tape. You'll never be the same. The copyright on this tape is only to prevent people from copying it and reselling it for their own profit. But if the Lord touches your heart to reproduce it, to give it away to relatives, friends, whoever, please feel free to do so. But I forbid anyone to change this message by editing it to distort the content in any way. Most of you know from studying your Bibles that Satan will build a false of the church, the whore of Revelation chapter 6, 13, 17, and 18, according to Bible prophecy. She will have great political, economic, military, and educational power, and she will persecute and murder the true believers in Christ. I always used to wonder how Satan would be able to pull this off right under Christians' noses without them being aware of what was happening and fighting back. But Satan is a master deceiver, and I'm beginning to see how he has cleverly set up smoke screens to hide the identity of the whore from the majority of Christian believers. Let me explain what I mean by a smoke screen. In warfare, you have enemy action. When they're moving in, they set up a smoke screen, and the smoke confuses everyone so that you don't know where your enemies are. That's one technique. The other is a fifth column, where you have the country that's about to fall. So you send in agents, and they wear the people down saying it's hopeless, or saying, no, the enemy isn't really going to attack. And they, in a sense, put up their own smoke screens to confuse the issue before the assault comes. I believe an assault is coming by the horror of Revelation. I believe they are setting up smoke screens, and that there are others within the Christian community that are setting up smoke screens. Now, we believe at Chick Publication that the horror of Revelation is the Roman Catholic institution. Our position is not something new. During the Reformation, you had men like Martin Luther, John Knox, Calvin, and so on. There was a great number of them. And then the great preachers like Moody, Finney, Spurgeon, and so on, they all believed the same thing, that the Vatican was the whore. It wasn't until lately that things have changed. You see, the Jesuits influenced people, and they started setting up smoke screens during all our times through our theological seminaries. And when that smoke screen came up, we started seeing the horror of Revelation in a different light. They said, oh no, this is something coming in the future, or, well, that happened way in the past. This is done to confuse the Christians. Today, many people believe this. They have been beguiled like I was when I first listened to some of these people. It was a clever smoke screen. I was confused at first. But now I see the horror in her fullness, and it is scary. I want to show you, in this tape, some of her activities in the past what she's doing today, and what her ultimate goal is for the future. Some will be overwhelmed when they hear this message, but I believe with all my heart that this information must be told. People must be aware of what's going on and how Satan is working to destroy the work of God in these closing hours. There has been a multi-million dollar campaign made through the media to convince people that I'm a bigoted, anti-Catholic, hate literature publisher. Do you know something? They have been very effective in convincing people that this is what I am. The truth is, I love the Catholic people enough to risk my life and my business to reach them with the gospel of Christ to pull them out of the false religious system they're now serving. I know what the system has done in the past and what it's planning for the future. I believe you'll understand when I finish this tape where I'm coming from. But before we get started, let's go into prayer. Dear Heavenly Father and Lord, we come before you. And we thank you, Father, for Calvin, for your finished work, Lord. For the terrible price you paid for our sins so that we can be taken into the beloved. Father, we thank you that we can come before the throne of grace and boldness, and that you are God who hears and answers prayer, Lord. That you protect and love and watch over us. In Jesus' name, we bind the forces of darkness surrounding anyone listening to this tape. And we loosen the angels of God to protect them against the attacks of satanic forces. I pray you'll open their spiritual eyes and give them wisdom that they may understand. I bind any critical or self-righteous spirit in any of the listeners in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to be broken before you as we turn to you for our help. And Lord, we pray that as a result of this tape, souls will be saved across this land where fire will start to burn in the hearts of the Christians. That they will see who their enemy is, how Satan is moving, and how to combat it, Lord. In Jesus' name, we ask your help to win the victory over the powers of darkness. Bless us now as we make this tape. Open the eyes and ears of those who are listening, Father. Touch them, and let them realize what's coming upon this earth. Let us be faithful, Lord, in your service. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 
There are some Christians who are awake to what's going on, but there are many Christians today who believe everything is just fine. Everybody loves everybody else. The Christian, Mormon, Jews, Jehovah Witnesses, Muslims are all serving the same God, but in different ways. If I asked, can you partake of the Lord's Supper with Catholics? They'd say, why not? Let's find out if there is a difference between the Lord's Supper and the Mass. Before I go on, let me explain that the bread or wafer used in the Mass is called a host. Now, when the host has been consecrated and offered as a sacrifice in the Mass, it then becomes the Eucharist. I'm going to try to put into everyday language what is one of the great motivating forces behind the Roman Catholic institution. It is the Eucharist. I call it the little Jesus cookie. I know Catholics are going to be offended by this, but I can't help it. The Protestants have to realize where they stand on this thing. The Roman Catholic institution in their canon laws state, quote, if anyone shall deny that the body, blood, together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore entire Christ are truly, really, and substantially contained in the sacrament of the most holy Eucharist, and shall say that he is only in it as a sign or in a figure, let him be accursed. Accursed means to be damned under a curse. Quote, if anyone shall say that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored in the holy sacrament of the Eucharist, and that he is not to be publicly set before the people to be adored, and that his adorers are idolaters, let him be accursed. That's when, beloved, the priest walks out holding up the cookie in the monstrand, which looks like a sunburst, and the people come up and kiss it and adore it. And if any Protestant would say, hey, that's idolatry, that means that Protestant is to be accursed. Now, to sum this up, the Roman Catholic institution teaches that you must believe that the bread or host consecrated in the Mass actually becomes Jesus Christ, and it is to be worshipped as God Almighty. This is why back in 1554, a priest carrying the Eucharist, the little Jesus cookie, could stand before a family of Christians in Scotland tied to posts with dried brush up to their waist. He'd hold that piece of bread before them and ask if what he held in his hand was actually the body, blood, and deity of Jesus Christ. And when they said, no, it's only a symbol, the priest's assistant placed his flaming torch into the brush and set those Bible believers on fire. As the victim screamed in agony, the priest held up his crucifix and said, all this is for the greater glory of God. It holds firm just as strong today as it did in the time of the Middle Ages, that anyone who ridicules it or says that it only represents Christ is damned. The Vatican II Council reaffirmed this. Pope John 23 said, quote, I do accept entirely all that has been decided and declared to the Council of Trent, unquote. That canon law is in effect today, beloved. This is a very difficult tape to make. Many of you will listen thinking it's unbelievable, yet I believe we can prove our position historically and scripturally. Listen carefully to some of the quotes we're going to make, and you'll see how Satan is moving and closing in in an attempt to destroy Bible Christianity. I believe one of the reasons Protestants are so desperately weak today is the fact that history has been covered up. Books have been rewritten. It only takes about two generations for everything to be forgotten, especially if it is not told over and over again. It's like the Holocaust of World War II. The Jews, thank God, are pressuring the network to show films on the Holocaust over and over on television so that people will remember what happened. But you see, something has been cleverly covered up and left to be forgotten. Most Christians know nothing of their heritage and the terrible price that was paid by those before us who stood against the Roman Catholic system. Many of our young people have no concept of what an Inquisition is. It is when a religious force moves in with such power, deception, and cruelty that it destroys everything standing in its way. Satan has dulled our hearing and thoughts concerning crimes of the past, and we as Americans cannot possibly conceive of such a thing happening here in our country. Is it possible? Christians of today are like little blades of grass growing up in the sunshine and there's a big lawnmower coming towards them and it's singing hymns and it's the Roman Catholic institution. Now these are harsh words but you must remember that the Roman Catholics believe with all their heart that their church is the church of Jesus Christ. They believe the Pope is the vicar or the representative of Jesus Christ on this earth. There is a teaching within the Roman Catholic structure called temporal power and temporal power means that the Pope should control every person on the face of this globe, their property and their religion. The Jesuits are pushing for this temporal power, which means a worldwide dictator. They believe this is the only way to go, and those who oppose them are the enemies of the gospel. 
Here's something interesting. Trudeau of Canada, who is surrounded by Jesuits, is setting up, quote, civilian internment camps, unquote. That's just a fancy name for concentration camps, and you can check this out in an article published in the Toronto Sun, dated March 4th, 1982. Now that's just above our borders, beloved. I mentioned earlier that much of history has been covered up. Let's go back and look at the bloody history of the Vatican. Then you'll have the fact to decide for yourself whether or not she is a great whore. Let's go back in history now and touch on what took place in France at the St. Bartholomew Massacre and what happened later in Ireland. We will then look at what took place in Yugoslavia during World War II. On August 22, 1572, the bloody St. Bartholomew Massacre began. This was to be one fatal blow to destroy the Protestant movement in France. The King of France had cleverly arranged a marriage between his sister and Admiral Coligny, the chief Protestant leader. There was a great feast, with much celebrating. After four days of feasting, the soldiers were given a signal. At twelve o'clock midnight, all the houses of the Protestants in the city were forced open at once. The Admiral was killed, his body thrown out of a window into the street, where his head was cut off and sent to the Pope. They also cut off his arms and privates and dragged him through the streets for three days until they finally hugged his body by the heels outside the city. They also slaughtered many other well-known Protestants. For the first three days, over 10,000 were killed. The bodies were thrown into the river, and the blood ran through the streets into the river until it appeared like a stream of blood. So furious was their hellish rage that they even slew their own followers if they suspected that they were not very strong in their belief in the Pope. From Paris, the destruction spread to all parts of the country. Over 8,000 more people were killed. Very few Protestants escaped the fury of their persecutors. A similar massacre occurred in Ireland in 1641. The conspirators picked October 23rd, the feast of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. They planned a general uprising for the whole country. All Protestants would be killed at once. To throw them off guard while the plan was being made, extra acts of kindness was shown to the Protestants. Early in the morning, the conspirators were armed and every Protestant they could find was immediately murdered. They showed no mercy. From children to the aged were killed. Even invalids were not spared. They were caught by complete surprise. They had lived in peace and safety for years and now found no place to run. They were massacred by neighbors, friends, and even relatives. Death often was the least they had to fear. Women were tied to posts, stripped to the waist, their breasts cut off with shears and left to bleed to death. Others who were pregnant were tied to tree branches. Their unborn babies cut out and fed to the dogs while their husbands were forced to watch. What I have just read is fully documented and historically factual. It is found in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Beloved, I want you to notice that both of these murderous assaults by the Vatican against the Christians in France and Ireland followed a similar pattern. Before the attacks, there was a time of healing when the Roman Catholics became friendly and warm. And in both cases, the Christians were so relieved that they let their guard down and assumed the Vatican had changed. This was their fatal mistake, and it cost them their lives. I pray to God you will not forget what you've just heard. You may say, well, that was a long time ago. It's not like that anymore. But has the Vatican really changed? Let's look at her actions during World War II. Many of you have not read our crusader book, The Godfathers, or the book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. And therefore, you don't really know what happened behind the scenes during World War II. So let me give you a brief picture of the conditions. The Jesuits had secretly prepared World War II, and Hitler's war machine was built and financed by the Vatican to conquer the world for Roman Catholicism. Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco were to be the defenders of the faith. They were set up to win and conquer the world and set up a millennium for the Pope. Behind the scenes, the Jesuits controlled the Gestapo. All this is fully documented in the Secret History of the Jesuits, published by Chief Publications. This is what the press of the Spanish dictator Franco published on the 3rd of May, 1945, the day of Hitler's death. It said, quote, Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church, died while defending Christianity, unquote. It went on to say, quote, Over his mortal remains stands his victorious moral figure with a poem of martyr, God gives Hitler the laurels of victory, unquote. Hitler himself stated, quote, I learned much from the order of the Jesuits. Until now, there has never been anything more grandiose on the earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. I transferred much of this organization into my own party, unquote. 
Walter Schellenberg, former chief of the Nazi counter-espionage, made this statement, quote, The SF organization has been constituted by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuit order. The regulations and the spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius of Loyola were the model Himmler tried to copy exactly. Himmler's title as Supreme Chief of the SS was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits' quote, general, unquote, and the whole structure was a close imitation of the Catholic Church's hierarchical order, unquote. Franz von Papen, another powerful Nazi who was instrumental in setting up the Concordat between Germany and the Vatican, had this to say, quote, The Third Reich is the first world power which not only acknowledges but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy, unquote. If you're not aware of what a concordat is, a concordat is an agreement between the Vatican and the government. As far as the Vatican is concerned, that government that signed the concordat has now become a part of the government of God, and the Vatican fully intends to stabilize that government, give it divine protection, and give it international protection. The three big defenders of the Roman Catholic faith were Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco. All three had concordats of the Vatican. When the Nazi war machine swept through the Balkans on the way to attack Russia, Yugoslavia had become a Nazi-occupied country. The Pope despised the Russian Orthodox members. They were called Serbians, and they were marked for death in Yugoslavia. They were given one choice, to convert to Catholicism or die. Why were they killed? Why did the Pope have such a vendetta against the Russian Orthodox? As we said in our Crusader book, The Godfathers, the Communist Party was created by the Vatican to destroy one of the greatest enemies, the Russian Orthodox Church. The Communists had double-crossed the Pope and refused to destroy the Russian Orthodox Church members, and at last Pope Pius XII had created the machine to do what the Communists had failed to do, butcher every Orthodox Church member and their clergy. Now let's see how this was accomplished. The Catholic priests changed their robes for the uniforms of the dreaded Eustachy Killer Squad and led the most barbaric brutal raids upon these people and practiced satanic torture never before known in the century. We're not talking 800 years ago. We're talking 1940. I was in high school then. The whore of Revelation showed her fangs and tore her enemies to shreds and cleverly covered up her crimes. All this is documented in many books, including Catholic Terror Today by Ava Manhattan. The book the following quotes were taken from. Quote, the non-Catholic population of Catholic Croatia, that's your Slavia, beloved, were given two basic alternatives, conversion or death. The church buildings were closed, parish documents destroyed, ecclesiastical buildings burned down, Orthodox worshippers very often were arrested inside their own churches and kept there or in local halls while awaiting their fates, forced conversion, concentration camps, or execution. Their survival, more often than not, depended upon the whim of the Ustachi commandant and of the Catholic padre, the priests accompanying them, unquote. Mass murders were supplemented by the massacre of individuals, mostly in rural districts. The Ostachi very often used the most primitive weapons, such as forks, spades, hammers, and saws, to torture their victims prior to their execution. They broke their legs and pulled off their skin and beards and blinded them by cutting their eyes with knives and even tearing them from their sockets, unquote. This information is documented by pictures and by sworn testimony of survivors. Quote, they did not spare women or children, to quote in one instance, in the villages between Vlasanica and Kladans, the Nazi occupational troops discovered children who had been impaled upon stakes by the Asashi. Their little members distorted the pain. Catholic priests advocated the killing of children. A Catholic priest named Jurek said, quote, Today it is no longer a sin to kill a child of seven should such a child be opposed to our movement of the Asashi. Unquote. Quote, the worst atrocities, strange as it may seem, were carried out by members of the intelligentsia. The case of Peter Brzeka is undoubtedly one of the most incredible of this category. Peter Brzeka had attended the Franciscan College Siloke Brzeg Irzagovina as a law student and a member of the Catholic Organization of Crusaders. In the concentration camp at Jazenovac on the night of August 29, 1942, orders were issued for executions. Bets were made as to who could liquidate the largest number of inmates. Peter Bredeka cut the throat of 1,360 prisoners with a specially sharp butcher's knife. Having been proclaimed the prize winner of the competition, he was elected king of the cutthroats. A gold watch, silver service, and a roasted sucking pig and wine were his rewards, unquote. The atrocities of the Astanchi far surpassed mere physical torture. The victims were tormented emotionally as well. 
An example of the unprecedented brutality is recorded by the sworn testimony of several witnesses regarding the following. Edna Vasenje, the Ustasi, arrested one whole Serbian family consisting of father, mother, and four children. The mother and children were separated from the father. For seven days they were tortured by starvation and thirst. Then they brought the mother and children a good-sized roast and plenty of water to drink. These unfortunates were so hungry that they ate the entire roast, and after they finished, the Ustasi told them that they had eaten the flesh of their father. This happened in our generation, beloved. This is an example of the unleashed rage of the Vatican. I once read that, quote, Rome, when in a minority, is as gentle as a lamb, when in equality is as clever as a fox, and when in the majority is as fierce as a tiger, unquote. And I believe that this is an accurate description. Do you believe this monster is simply a backslidden or apostate church like many of our Christian leaders tell us? Or is she the whore of revelation? Let's look at scripture and check it out for ourselves. We find in chapter 17 of the book of Revelation, the Bible says, quote, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sit upon many waters, unquote. And of course, in scripture, the reference to many waters means multitudes of people. And today, the Vatican boasts almost one billion followers. What's that, almost a quarter of the earth's population? And it says, quote, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, unquote. And if you look back in history, you'll see that almost every king has had political, economic, or religious ties with the Vatican, starting with Constantine the Great, who was actually the first pope and presided over the first council. Constantine was never saved. That was another smokescreen. Most nations today have diplomatic representatives in the Vatican. Quote, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication, unquote. We have just looked at the madness of World War II and how it was set up by the justice. And the Bible goes on to say, quote, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, unquote, and these are the official colors of the Vatican. Quote, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, unquote. Did you know the Vatican is the wealthiest organization on the face of the earth? Later in the tape I'll go into this in more detail. The Bible goes on to say, quote, And on her forehead was, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, unquote. Where did Catholicism come from? If you do a little research, you'll find it came from the ancient Babylonian mysteries, and you can trace it right back to Nimrod and Semiramis. Only the names were changed to make it look like a Christian organization. Quote, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, unquote. Can I name a few abominations that came from Rome? We have the Nazi party, which was staffed with Jesuits and high-ranking Catholics. And then we have the Communist Party, another offshoot or branch of the mother of harlots. Listen to these names. Marx, Engel, Stalin, Lenin, Fidel Castro, all were trained and guided by Jesuits. We're publishing two new books to go into detail on this. So these are her babies, just a few of them, not to mention some of the spirit cults like voodoo. In the voodoo creed, they state that along with the religion of demon possession, they believe in, quote, the holy Roman Catholic Church, unquote. The Bible goes on to say, quote, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, unquote. The Roman Catholic institution tortured maimed and murdered 68 million people during the Spanish Inquisition alone, and many of these were Bible-believing Christians. Who would you say the whore of revelation is? Is it something that will come in the future? Or are we stuck with it right now? Beloved, it is obvious the whore of revelation is the Roman Catholic institution, and God hates it. He wants his people to come out of it so that his love can be manifested. God says, quote, if you love me, keep my commandments, unquote, John 14, 15. At the end of the Dark Ages, when the popes ruthlessly controlled Europe, God raised up Christian men and women who knew the Bible and loudly proclaimed that the deadly Roman Catholic institution was a whore of revelation. As a Christian, what do I do concerning the whore of revelation? I'm accused of not showing love and of being too harsh in excluding Catholicism. Am I being unscriptural? Let's see. Bible Christianity and Roman Catholicism are doctrinally as far apart as the East is from the West. One is based on the Bible and the other on the traditions of men. So how can we walk together without compromise? It's impossible. Many Protestants and Charismatic Catholics claim that the Holy Spirit is drawing them together. But is it the Holy Spirit of God? Or could it be a different spirit? Are Charismatic Catholics leading the whore of Revelation? Or are they being used to pull the Protestants to Rome? Some charismatic Catholics claim that after being baptized by the Holy Spirit, they have a deeper relationship with Mary. They can recite the rosary in tongues and so on. 
None of this is in the Bible. They are the inventions of man. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2-4, it says, quote, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be con corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Unquote. Paul is warning them here against following anyone preaching another gospel. And then in John 16:13 it says, quote, How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, unquote. Now, God the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. How can he lead someone deeper into error? That's impossible, beloved. That's a different spirit, and it's not from God. Satan is the master deceiver, and this is his clever religious game to pull Protestants under the control of the whore. Has Rome changed? <laughs> beloved, when the whore of Revelation dumps the mass, the veneration, or worship of Mary, and when they throw away their rosaries and repent from claiming that Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus, and when they admit they cooked up the idea of purgatory, and when the priests of Rome concede to the priesthood of all believers, when the whore of Revelation does all that, then I will believe she is changing. And people say she is changing, but, beloved, she is only changing her tactic. How does the harlot or whore seduce her victims? The book of Proverbs tells us in chapter 7, verses 6 through 10, quote, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way of her house in the twilight and the evening and the black of the dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart, unquote. Then verses 22 and 24 through 27, quote, With her much fair speech she caused him to yield, with the flattering of her lips she forced him. He goeth after her straight way as an ox goeth to the slaughter. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her way. Go not astray in her path, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death." Unquote. The Bible says the mother of harlots will produce kings and nations with her cunning. But the nations have been made drunk, which means they're confused, disoriented, unstable, and can be easily deceived and conquered by it. Today, the whore has beguiled and flattered our Christian readers into believing that he is part of the true body of Christ, and is simply a backslidden or apostate church. I was shocked at being accused of dividing the brethren. They refer to the scripture which says, quote, Mark those who cause division among you and avoid them, unquote. But the mother, why do they leave out the middle of the verse? Is there something wrong with it? Why don't they quote the whole thing? It says, quote, Now I beseech you, mark those which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them, unquote. This verse is found at the end of Romans, the great book on salvation by faith, not works. It's telling us to avoid those who teach anything other than salvation by faith in Christ alone. It is a warning against cult. A cult is anything that takes away from the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice on salvation. I'm causing a division, all right, but not between brethren. We need to be specific about the different kinds of division. We must not create division between our brethren in Christ, those who hold the true gospel that we're saved by faith and faith alone. But the Bible says we must separate from those teaching false doctrine, another gospel. It's a division between the saved and the lost. Jesus said in Matthew 10:34, quote, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth, I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it." Unquote. Jesus is talking here about separation. We must take a stand for the gospel, no matter what the cost. I'd like to quote a dear brother in Christ, and I think this will help put things in their proper perspective. He said, quote, Because we live at a time when terms like love and unity are so appealing, it is quite difficult to argue that these words have been taken out of context and do not mean what we think they mean. Love without truth is whoredom. 
To compromise is to reject the gospel, and without the gospel there is no hope. In a choice between unity and truth, unity must yield to truth, for it is far better to be divided by truth than to be united in error." Unquote. In his word, God says that truth is all important, that we should depart from those who hold not the truth. God says that we should examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good and reject that which is evil. Dare we set aside what God says? Some say we're standing on the brink of the end of the Protestant era. And we'll see the birth of the super church. Beloved, that super church has always been here, as God's people were supposed to oppose her until the Roman Catholics could come out of her in obedience to Christ. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5.11, quote, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, unquote. Reprove means to express the approval of, to rebuke, to expose it for what it is. Christ tells us in the book of Revelations, chapter 18, verses 6 and 7, concerning the mother of Harlot, to, quote, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double under her double according to her works in the cup that she hath filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and did live deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, unquote. That's the only place in Scripture we are told fight back. It is our responsibility. She has betrayed the Catholic people. She has explained Protestantism. And by God's grace, we will lift the self-righteous robes off that horn and expose her filthy running sores, her lies and crimes, the blood that's on her hands, and her murderous intentions against God's people. When we expose her and the Catholic people see what she has done, and the world sees, they're going to flee from her and turn to Christ. What kind of warfare are Christians to be in? It's a spiritual war. We're not to pick up weapons and go after the Catholic people. You must understand what's involved here. We're locked into a spiritual warfare over the souls of men. The Bible says, quote, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, unquote. Ephesians 6, 12. The Bible explains it in Ephesians 6. If we follow this through and arm ourselves and fight the spiritual warfare, then we'll be victorious. But Christ has to go before us. Beloved, we are in spiritual warfare. Be on the offensive. Never give in. Satan hates prayer. Take authority over occult powers in the name of our Lord. Assault the gates of hell and he'll fall back. Satan can only harm us if God gives him the authority, so he bluffs and lies and threatens to settle. Regardless of the technique to confuse, if the Lord Jesus is lifted up, Satan is damaged. And when we've done all, we must have the to stand. We cannot stand on our own. It's only through the grace and power of God. Always send the Lord before you in the battle. Am I wrong in exposing the whore? No. I'm being obedient to the word of God. Our position might not be the popular one, but we're not out to please men. In Galatians 1.10 it says, quote, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. Unquote. When World War II ended, the Vatican had egg all over its face. Pope Pius XII, after building the Nazi war machine, saw Hitler losing his battle against Russia, and he immediately jumped to the other side as he saw the handwriting on the wall. General Eisenhower saved his neck. Pope Pius XII should have stood before the judges in Nuremberg. His war crimes were worthy of death. The Vatican was pulling every string she could, and Pope Pius XII came out smelling like a rose. <clears throat> Too many people knew that the Vatican was responsible for World War II, so it was time for a facelift, time to start up smoke screen. The Vatican II Council came into existence, and the mother of Harlot put on a new makeup job. She wiped her mouth with her bloody hands and said, Why well, change? Now I like the Protestants. I'm not going to call them heretics anymore. A separated brethren. She told the Protestants to forget the past. It was now a time to push a love gospel, a time of healing. Just like in France and Ireland. Remember? There were so many books in the Gospel bookstore exposing the horror that the Vatican had to create a common enemy for both Catholics and Protestants to unite against. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen launched the anti-communist attack, and behold, like mushrooms, we saw anti-communist ministries popping up, exposing the monster in Moscow. The Jesuits were busy on many fronts. The John Burke Society blossomed, aided by the Jesuits, because it served their purpose to have the attention of the Protestants shifted from the Vatican to communism. At that time, Senator McCarthy was riding high. Publishers stopped publishing books exposing the horror and turned their attention to communism. Some Christian publishers were bought out. Others didn't want to make a stand because he could raise his eyebrows. So the Vatican was succeeding in their goal. Their boys, planted in Protestant denominations, frowned on anti-Catholic sermons and discouraged them across the nation. 
we were locked into a Cold War with Russia. Hollywood, influenced by a powerful Catholic lobby, furnished us with films like Song of Bernadette and Going My Way, and a number of exciting films glorifying the Catholic faith. On the other hand, they pushed movies like Elmer Gantry showing crooked Protestant evangelists. Do you, do you remember Dragnet on television? The Christian was always pictured with a big Bible smiling after he'd strangled Grandma up in the attic. And always a priest with a big guy, just like in a popular television series called MASH. You see, we're hit psychologically on many fronts. Do I dare talk about Christian television? I think I'd better. Let's take a look at what happened on our Christian television network. We have Jim Baker on CTL, and we have 700 Club with Pat Robertson, and the biggie here on the West Coast is Paul and Jen Krauss with the TBN. They all have something in common. They've all had nuns and priests on their program. I've watched Paul and Jan on Channel 40, and sometimes I feel so heavy-hearted. I've watched all these nuns and priests coming on, and I once heard Paul and Jan saying, Oh, I don't understand the math, but it's very interesting. God has warned us as Christians to have nothing to do with the works of darkness. They have a priest that they're sponsoring on their network program. His name is Manning. He wistfully looks at the Protestants and begs for funds to sponsor Catholic missionaries. Christians are depriving their own pastors and their own churches by sending the money in the TBN for the priest. Those dear little old grandmothers send him love offerings, and it's only making the Vatican wealthier. There's going to be a lot to give an account for, beloved. We've ended up with Christian show business. We have a bunch of new stars singing snappy little songs and swinging hymns and beating drums and wearing sequins and telling us how good Jesus is. We can watch a variety of speakers and singers for hours on end. So who reads the Bible when they can watch Christian television? It looks like it has replaced the word of God for many. They're looking at people instead of going to the Bible for answers and getting their noses into history to find out what's going on. Some people have Channel 40 and PKL on like a rabbit's foot. They figure God's going to bless them because they have this holy program on. I have a friend whose dad is an unsaved Roman Catholic. This man goes to Mass, beats his wife, swears like a saver, drinks his booze, and he watches Christian television every night. The house is filled with statues of saints and the Virgin Mary and the crucifix, and he gets blind drunk. He sits there with a cigar in his booze and with his feet up on a chair, and he watches Paul and Jan. He is convinced, after watching the Catholics on that network, that he is on his way to heaven. When his son-in-law tries to witness to him, he points to the smiling priests and nuns on those Christian stations and says, See? We're all Christians! I believe this man's blood is going to be on their hands. The Vatican now has a satellite, and soon the Pope will be able to speak to every Roman Catholic on the face of the earth at the same time. Beloved, if you play pussy with the Vatican, you lose. I believe in the future you will see that our Christian television heroes with their giant ministries will soon be picked off one by one. All of the biggies will fall for one reason or another, and the last hero alive will be his holiness in the Vatican, and the world will love him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6.14, quote, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, unquote. And then in verse 17 it goes on to say, quote, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty." Unquote. The Vatican always looks and plans away into the future, from 25 to 50 to 100 years in advance. After World War II, the Vatican had to take them back an American champion who would be a friend, a man they would help put on a pedestal who would be loved by everybody, and God forbid that he should ever be a Martin Luther. This champion would rule and win the hearts of the American people, a biggie, a champion they would support. He could be used as the Pied Piper who would pull all the evangelicals into the arms of the Pope. They wanted a man who would be a good speaker, a man with charisma, who could pack stadiums, a man who would preach a gospel message, but on the soft side. One who would never attack the Vatican. So when they found him, William Randolph Hearst, a good Roman Catholic publisher, used his newspaper chain to push Billy Graham to fame. For 30 years, Billy Graham spoke to multitudes and became greatly loved, respected, and indicated. When he preached, he was honored, and men praised him. Yet when Jesus Christ preached, they killed him. I've often read 
The scripture, quote, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, unquote. The newspapers never really blasted Billy Graham. Magazine said he was one of the world's most loved men. Somehow I kept getting a tilt sign flashing in my mind. I loved Billy, prayed for him, and supported him. But I think something was wrong. I was told that when Anita Bryant spoke out against homosexuals and asked for Billy's support, he turned it down. He played it cool. Anita Bryant took the heat and was persecuted for her son, but not Billy. He was loved by the world for his thesis. Billy Graham began his ministry as a fundamentalist, and his time passed to change his position. Listen to this. In the Catholic Herald of June 3rd, 1966, Billy Graham is quoted as being a friend of the Jesuits in the United States. Here's another one. Dr. Billy Graham received an honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters from the Roman Catholic College, Belmont Abbey, in 1967. Billy noted the significance of the occasion by saying that this was a time when Catholics and Protestants could meet together and greet one another as brothers, whereas ten years ago they did not. April 1972, Billy Graham received the International Franciscan Award in Minneapolis given by the Franciscan Friars for True Ecumenism. Before I quote what Billy Graham said about Francis Assisi, first let me say this about St. Francis. He believed he was saved by works, by helping the poor. This way he believed he was saving his soul. St. Francis was canonized, which means he was made a saint by the Roman Catholic institution because of his strong position on the doctrine of works. Beloved, we know that this is unscriptural. Did you know that St. Francis of Assisi blessed and baptized animals and gave them Christian names? Now, what did Billy Graham say about this strange fellow? He said, quote, While I am not worthy to touch the shoelaces of St. Francis, yet the same Christ that called Francis in the 13th century also called me to be one of his servants in the 20th century, unquote. When Billy Graham appeared on the Phil Donahue show of October 11, 1979, in discussing Pope John Paul II's visit to the United States of America, Billy Graham said, quote, I think the American people are looking for a leader, a moral and spiritual leader, to believe something. And he, meaning the Pope, does. He didn't mince words on a single subject. As a matter of fact, his subject in Boston was really an evangelistic address in which he asked the people to come to Christ to give their lives to Christ. I said, thank God I've got somebody to quote now with some real authority, unquote. How tragic. A man who once used the Bible as his authority is now putting the Pope up on a pedestal and looking to him. In the beginning, Billy Graham was greatly used of God, and I believe Billy gave him tremendous pressures and compromise, and he is now walking hand in hand with the horror of revelation. A few years ago, five pastors from Mexico came to see me asking for help, and they told me I must talk to Billy Graham. I told them that was impossible. I was just a little track publisher. Then they told me Billy Graham had destroyed their churches. They said he held a crusade and told all those who had received Christ to go back to their original churches and win those people to Christ. The pastors told me their people followed Billy's instructions and all went back to the Roman Catholic system. Twelve years of work destroyed in one night. Dr. Rivera, the ex-Jesuit priest, told me he knew Billy was being used by the Vatican in 1950 when the word came to all the Jesuits in Central and South America telling them to fill the stadiums with Roman Catholics whenever Billy Graham spoke. Millions were spent to promote Billy Graham as the world's great evangelist. Rome gives nothing to anybody unless to pay it off. Could it be that his final payoff was to introduce Pope John Paul II as the greatest moral leader of the world? Which he did. Didn't he realize when he said this he was giving the whore cloak of respectability? And all of Billy's followers, the evangelicals and multitudes of others across this land who listened to his every word, heard this endorsement and trust in Billy, turned and gave their love to the communists from Poland dressed in his papal robes, who claims to be the representative of Christ on this earth. I can picture the Pope smiling to himself, flying back victoriously to Rome. He knew that Billy had been a good investment. It's a deadly game, beloved, and now that this work is over, he's no longer needed. I believe the Vatican set Billy up when he went to Russia. Believers in Christ go to our Lord for guidance into the scriptures, and pray that God the Holy Spirit will lead us in all truth. But Billy admitted that he sought advice from Vatican officials about his trip to Russia. They told him to go quietly and not to criticize the communist practices. And when he followed their instructions, the suffering brothers and sisters rotting in Russian prisons who got five to ten years for passing out a single gospel tract were crushed when Billy announced to the world that there was religious freedom in Russia. Yes, beloved, Billy Graham, as much as I love him and hate to say it, I believe was cleverly used as a smokescreen and with a five piper for the whore of revelation. 
When a Catholic plot is discovered or exposed, Rome calls upon specialists to solve the problem. These are men who are called truth distorters. They spearhead attacks to counter those who are trying to one another. In World War II, when the Vatican was massacring the Greek Orthodox Church members in Yugoslavia, survivors tried to reach the United States to tell of the murders of documented evidence. Once the information started coming in about what was happening in Yugoslavia, the master truth distorters moved against it, calling it anti-Catholic propaganda and bigotry. They minimized the atrocities to confuse the public. Such a man was Louis Ademus. His job was to convince the American people that the reports of the horrible massacres in Yugoslavia were not true. Adamic and the Catholic lobby, working with him, convinced President Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor that these massacres, the worst crimes of World War II, were only propaganda. Adamic persuaded Mrs. Roosevelt that these reports were false. When she discovered they were true, it was too late. Almost one million people had already met a gas in death. The Jesuits saw this as a critical area in a Christian community that would help the Vatican. They needed a group of experts to investigate cult, but they must never discuss Rome as an enemy. This would be another smokescreen. There are men in the Christian community who are highly trusted, loved, and respected, and I believe that these men, either knowingly or unknowingly, are doing the same job for the Vatican as Louis Bonnet did. These men are dulling the eyes and ears of the Christian believers by assuring them that the Pope is our friend. Their job is to play it down, ridicule, and destroy the reputation of anyone trying to sound the alarm. They tell concerned Christians that it is a lie, a joke, unreliable, the material and evidence is a hoax and should be discarded as junk. The Jesuits would need someone in a critical position to protect them in Protestant circles. If a person could be found, he could rise to a position of trust as a watchdog to protect the Protestants from the cult. A man who would join the ranks of those exposing the biblical errors of Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, Moonies, and Eastern religions, and yet never attack the Roman Catholic institution as the whole revelation, but only refer to the system as, quote, backridden or apostate Christian church, unquote, which, of course, is the line of devil's view. Such a person could be very valuable for the cause of Roman Catholicism. Such a man could be a perfect smokescreen. Anyone rising up to sound the alarm about the horror of our revelation, trying to warn the Christians of a new inquisition, could easily be shot down by this expert on the cult because so many would trust him. One of the most difficult decisions I faced since I'd been a Christian publisher was after I heard Dr. Rivera's true story, saw all his documents, photos, IDs, and letters proving that he was a Jesuit priest. When it finally dawned on me that we were being set up for another inquisition, I realized what a mess I'd be in. If I sounded the alarm and the Christians wouldn't believe it. I could lose our business, our reputation and friends if I printed Alberto's story. I would be going into a battle that would jeopardize my family and my own life. I realized no other Christian publisher would hit this issue because they could go under and business-wise it could be a disaster for me. I went before the Lord in prayer and the thing I dreaded came to pass. I asked the Lord if I should attack the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Should I attack the Vatican? The Lord said yes. And so we published Alberto. I hoped down in my heart Walter Martin would back me up. One thing stuck in my mind. Why didn't Walter Martin sound the alarm? He was a great expert on cult, especially since he knew all the history about the Inquisition, and yet it kept quiet. Why is Walter Martin defending this evil system and calling it a Christian church? The man's a genius. He knows about our history, and yet he's defending the horror of revelation. Here is a man I used to pray for, but no longer. The Lord stopped me. Beloved, the Bible tells us to seek the Lord in prayer. I go to prayer and get a specific answer from the Lord. I tell somebody I prayed about it, and they say, Oh, that's a cop-out. I really don't understand how they can say that. The Bible instructs us to seek the Lord for guidance. Have these people gotten so far off base they can't understand a person trusting in Christ for guidance? If he is Lord, he must be the Lord of every part of our lives. Letter after letter is coming and telling us how Roman Catholics have been saved through our material, and yet Christians sit around cracking their knuckles. The fields are white under harvest, and these people are going to hell all around us. We've got 60 million Roman Catholics to be reached, and nobody wants to get involved. They're so afraid of what others will think of them, that they would rather sit back and watch people go to hell than risk offending them. When the heat came on chick publications for what we're doing, I was amazed. It all came through the same group. There seemed to be a link between all these men who are promoting the story that Alberto is a fraud. Gary Metz had his article published in Cornerstone Christianity Today and Our Sunday Visitor, a Catholic periodical. Brian Onken, Martin's research consultant, 
wrote an article that blasted us and defended the mother of cult. Then you've got Bill Jackson in San Jose and Bart Brewer in San Diego. Both of these men are supposed to be operating ministries to Catholics, and yet they're going around the churches trying to destroy our credibility. Why? Doesn't that make you a little suspicious? Does Walter Martin speak to the body of Christ? No, only the Word of God does this. Yet this man stands on his pedestal with both hands filled with slanderous garbage supplied by the Vatican and pro-Catholic sources, and he throws it at Alberto's character to destroy his reputation. Dr. Rivera says he has copies of the original material sent to Martin by the Vatican and the Jesuit superiors in Rome. But you'll notice Martin hasn't bothered to attack Alberto's message that the Vatican is a horror revelation. Only Alberto the man. And yet, is Martin without sin? What about Martin's past? His reputation could be slanderously destroyed also, just like anyone else's. Would this discredit all his information on Mormonism and Jehovah Witnesses? No. God uses us in spite of ourselves. Who is really worthy to be used of God? Look in the Bible. Moses was a murderer and David was an adulterer, and yet God used them in spite of their human failings. Our job is not to pick up dirt on any man. The Lord will take care of that because we'll all give an account on the Day of Judgment. God knows the hearts. We don't. Our job is to lift up Christ and evangelize the lost. The Catholic-controlled news media picked up the campaign against us. Even U.S. News and World Report with the blasted worldwide. Christianity Today did wonders for the Vatican. Their article was reprinted in Europe and Australia, etc. I couldn't believe the extent of the money spent to silence us. Before the book Alberto even got into Germany, the message was plastered all over Germany, France, South America, Mexico, Canada, into Asia, and England. What was so important about our comic Alberto that this group would go to such lengths to try to discredit it? The sad thing is, all this money and energy was spent to stop the soul-winning comic book, and yet we have all these adult bookstores and garbage like that and nobody says a word. But when we spoke out against Rome, all hell broke loose. A, a man once told me, Jack, if you throw a rock down a dark alley and you hear a yell, you'll know you hit something. Well, from the sound of the scream that was let loose, I think we hit something big. On the night of February 2nd, 1982, I was watching Channel 40, the Trinity Broadcasting Network in Southern California. Harold Bredesen, a prominent ecumenical leader, was talking to Walter Martin. Bredesen turned to the camera and he said something like this. Walter Martin was the one who helped the charismatic movement to be accepted by the denomination by not attacking it. And Walter hung his head and smiled. You see, beloved, Walter Martin called the Roman Catholic charismatic his brothers and sisters in Christ. These people still attend Mass and worship the little Jesus cookie as God Almighty. Did you see the danger here? It looks like we've been betrayed, beloved. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4.14, quote, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, unquote. Beloved, I've seen the tremendous spiritual damage Walter Martin has done in discrediting our book exposing the horror revelation. In that precious Roman Catholics trusting wholeheartedly in Walter Martin has stayed in that system because he wouldn't tell them to come out. Martin's followers see no need to reach the Roman Catholic people. They look upon our soul-winning material with contempt. And I say with a heavy heart, as Paul did, may the Lord reward Walter Martin according to his works. The Bible says, quote, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord, unquote. Jeremiah 17, 5. Think about it. Could this be another smokescreen to make Christians believe that the horror of Revelation is really a Christian group? Jesus says, quote, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of the sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Unquote. Revelations 18.4 Does Walter Martin tell them to come out? Not that I know of. Which one will you follow? Remember when the Pope came to the United States, how he chided us for not showing mercy, that we should give away what we have to the poor? We're such a wealthy nation. And then remember the great earthquake that took place in 1980 over in Italy? I remember when the Pope came into this ruined area, walked up to the bedside of some poor little wounded Italian man, and the Pope so benevolently laid his hand on his head and made the sign of the cross, blessed the man, and walked off. And the newscasters were telling of the devastation, and then we cut back to the United States, and Senator Kennedy, the man who will probably be the next president, looked at the camera with sorrowful eyes and said, Oh, we Americans out of mercy, we should send at least $45 million to this devastated village so we can reconstruct it. Remember that?
Now let me read something out of The Vatican Billions by Avril Manhattan, and I think you're going to get as mad as I am right now. I want to bring to your attention the fact that this information was published ten years ago, and the figures are probably even more startling today. Quote, The Vatican has large investments with the Rothschilds of Britain, France, and America, with the Hambro's Bank, with the Credit Suisse in London and Zurich. In the United States, it has large investments with the Morgan Bank, the Chase Manhattan Bank, the First National Bank of New York, the Bankers Trust Company, and others. The Vatican has billions of shares in the most powerful international corporations such as Gulf Oil, Shell, General Motors, Bethlehem Steel, General Electric, International Business Machines, TWA, etc. At a conservative estimate, these amount to more than $500 million in the U.S. alone. Quote, in a statement published in connection with a bond prospectus, the Boston Archdiocese listed its assets at $635 million, which is 9.9 .9 times its liabilities. This leaves a net worth of $571 million. It is not difficult to discover the truly astonishing wealth of the Church. Once we add the richest of the 28 archdioceses and the 122 dioceses of the USA, some of which are even wealthier than that of Boston. Quote, Some idea of the real estate and other forms of wealth controlled by the Catholic Church may be gathered by the remark of a member of the New York Catholic Conference, namely, that his church probably ranks second only to the United States government in total annual purchase. Another statement made by a national syndicated Catholic priest perhaps is even more telling. The Catholic Church, he said, must be the biggest corporation in the United States. We have a branch office in every neighborhood. Our assets and real estate holdings must exceed those of Standard Oil, AT&T, and U.S. Steel combined. And our roster of dues-paying members must be second only to the tax rolls of the United States government. Quote, the Catholic Church, once all her assets have been put together, is the most formidable stockbroker in the world. The Vatican, independently of each successive pope, has been increasingly oriented towards the United States. The Wall Street Journal said that the Vatican's financial deals in the U.S. alone were so big that very often it sold or bought gold in lots of a million or more dollars at one time. Quote, the Vatican's treasure of solid gold has been estimated by the United Nations World Magazine to amount to several billion dollars. A large bulk of this is stored in gold ingots with the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, while banks in England and Switzerland hold the rest. But this is just a small portion of the wealth of the Vatican, which in the U.S. alone is greater than that of the five wealthiest giant corporations in the country. When to that is added all the real estate property, stocks, and shares abroad, then the staggering accumulation of the wealth of the Catholic Church becomes so formidable as to defy any rational assessment. Quote, the Catholic Church is the biggest financial power, wealth accumulator, and property owner in existence. She is a greater possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, bank, giant trust, government, or state of the whole globe. The Pope, as the visible ruler of this immense amassment of wealth, is consequently the richest individual of the 20th century. No one can realistically assess how much he is worth in terms of billions of dollars." Unquote. And I think back about how the Pope, the wealthiest man on this planet, walked up to that poor little Italian man lying in that rubble, put his hand on his head and said, Bless you, and then walked away and just left him there. That has got to be the height of hypocrisy. And then Senator Kennedy, the Pope's boy over in the United States, makes the big pitch to the U.S. people to foot the bill to repair that devastated village right in the Pope's backyard. What a setup. I questioned Dr. Rivera about the briefings he received in the Vatican when he was a Jesuit priest. I asked him if he was briefed on how the Vatican planned to take over the United States. He told me his indoctrination went back to the time of the pilgrims. Because of the knowledge of the Inquisition and the slaughter of Christians by the Roman Catholic system, the early immigrants in America began passing laws to keep Jesuits out of this country and to outlaw the Mass, to protect themselves from the Vatican takeover. These were Christian communities deeply concerned about the Horror of Revelation. Jesuits began arriving in America as early as the second group of pilgrims. They used different names with IDs. They were followed years later when the Vatican sent multitudes of Catholic families from England, Ireland, and France posing as Protestants into the colonies. These were plants. They were holding secret masses in defiance of the laws. In those days, no Roman Catholic was to hold any position in civil government. 
the Jesuits made sure this part of our history was erased and removed. The next major move by the Jesuits was to destroy or control all the Christian schools across America. Throughout the years, Jesuits working undercover have gotten into special committees on school boards to remove the emphasis of the Bible and replace it with psychology as found in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit Society. Later, Catholic schools and universities sprang up all across the nation under the Jesuits. Today, they probably outnumber all the Christian schools and colleges put together. The third stage was to move into the courts and legislation and branches of the judiciary to take over as judges and lawyers in order to manipulate the Constitution in their favor until it could be changed. Once this was accomplished, the thrust was into politics to capture the political parties, then the military and the newspapers. Even back in the times of Lincoln, over half the newspapers in the United States were controlled by the Vatican. I asked Dr. Rivera, what about the military picture today? How Catholic is our military position? And Dr. Rivera said, horrifying. I then asked about the political picture. And Dr. Rivera said, it's even worse. Then I said, what about the Catholic structure in the judiciary? Dr. Rivera shook his head and said, it is very painful because of the heavy Jesuit penetration in this area. Most of the judicial decisions are distorting and perverting the Constitution of the United States to take away our freedoms, preparing the way for anarchy for the final takeover of the United States. Then I said, is this preparing the way for the coming inquisition? And Dr. Rivera said, that's correct. First for anarchy, we were briefed that after all these years of penetration and infiltration, what was needed was riot and anarchy in order to finally take over. By the time the Roman Catholic institution is ready to take over politically, militarily, educationally, and religiously, that means that they will have some legal basis to do so, and this will be through the conquered dad, which has already been prepared, and that is already being negotiated. I see happening right now what I was told during those briefings back in the Vatican. Then I said to him, is the Vatican behind our present recession and economic situation? And is this leading us towards the coming riots? And Dr. Rivera said, yes, that's correct. You can see right now that the Vatican is playing certain tricks with the economy. The world is going through an economic crisis, and the Vatican would have us to believe that it is affecting them also. This is just a cover-up. And then I said, what about the possibility of strikes? How deeply are they involved in the unions? And Dr. Rivera replied, the Roman Catholic institution has prepared that well because the unions are led by the Jesuits in this country. What this means is the unions will never rest until they see that every industry in this country collapses. Then I said, what do you see as a hope for the United States? A revival among the Christians? And they actually start exposing Rome and pastors start preaching this from the pulpits? Or is it already too late? And Dr. Rivera replied, it's never too late because it's in the hands of the Lord. What I believe with all my heart to the study of the scriptures plus my personal experience with a harlot is that prophetically speaking, God is going to fulfill his prophecy and he will allow these prophecies to take place in the United States. But it is a matter of time. What we are dealing with here is that God can either shorten or lengthen the time until these events take place. The Roman Catholic institution is feeling the impact of your publications. And the message that God has given us during these last days in the sense that they themselves know that if they carry out certain actions, people will immediately detect and will recognize what the Vatican is up to. This is one of the dilemmas they face right now. If it were not for the publications we printed, we would be in a different situation today. What that means is the Lord has granted every Christian, pastor, and church in the United States, without them even being aware of it, and even those who are opposing us, they are being preserved and the Lord is giving us more time in order that the Christians may respond. If we act according to the will of God in these prophetical days against the tricks, programs, and actions of the harlot in the United States, we will not be able to destroy her, we will not be able to stop her, but we will be able to do two things. First, to carry the message of the gospel to the lost Roman Catholic people. Second, we will have time enough for the Christian church to realize that her mission is here and now, not tomorrow. And God is just waiting for the church to act in order to restrain the forces of evil, the powers of darkness, the Pope, the Jesuits, and the Catholic institution from committing the crimes she is about to put into action the minute she completely takes over the United States. Then I said, Now this is the information you received in the Vatican under the teachings of Augustine Cardinal Dia and the Jesuit General Pedro Arrupi. And Dr. Rivera said yes, and also from the previous Jesuit General. Then I said, Were they very confident of taking over the United States? And Dr. Rivera said, very much so, very confident. They have the necessary influence to control either political party, regardless of whichever party is in power. And they will have their goals accomplished. Then I said, so they now have the influence to control both political parties? And Dr. Rivera said, yes. Then I said, 
They control our post office and the media. And Dr. Rivera said, let's put it this way. The word control, I don't think is the proper word right now. I will say this. There is a very strong influence. There is a certain amount of control, but it is not absolute control in any of the areas. This is why we are still blessed by the fact that there are still men in the FBI. There are men of the CIA, men in Congress, men in the Senate, men in the judicial system, men in every strata of life in the United States that still, many not even being Christians, are still Americans that are still loyal to the principles of the Constitution as given from the beginning, not as it is now. And then I said, okay, who are the Knights of Columbus loyal to? Where, do their, where does their loyalty stand? With the United States or with the Vatican? Dr. Rivera said, the Knights of Columbus have to give their loyalty to the Pope. They cannot base it on the Constitution of the United States because they would be destroyed by the Vatican if they did so, as others have been destroyed in the past. Then I said, will the Knights of Columbus play a vital part in the attack against the Christians when the U.S. falls? And Dr. Rivera said, oh yes, in fact, in their oath, you can see how close their alliance is to the Pope. They committed themselves to be killed or destroyed if they failed to comply with their oath. They asked the militia of the Pope, the Jesuits, to put them to death. They are committed to make America Catholic. Then I said, thank God we've had the privilege of printing these books. And Dr. Rivera said, yes, the privilege and the blessing of the Lord. And then I thanked him. Let me read something to you. Life magazine reviewed one phase of Roman Catholic power in America. The leading story of the May 27th edition was devoted to the 75th year of the Knights of Columbus. The, the pictures, many in full color, depicted the kind of pomp and circumstance which goes into Roman strategy. The legions of Rome are awesome. More than one million practicing Catholics make up the ranks of the Knights of Columbus. They are fraternally pledged to the ideal of bringing America under papal rule. They are powerful, wealthy, loyal. Little wonder that the Pope affectionately described the Knights as the right lay arm of the Catholic Church in America, unquote. I believe if we had kept silent in five years, it would have been over. The plans for the takeover would have been in full operation. No one would have been able to withstand it. But because we did go ahead with Alberto, I believe we knocked back their timetable at least five years. And our hope and prayer here is that with the material we're publishing, we'll be able to wreck the timetable for at least a generation that our children can survive before they unleash their holocaust against us. I can almost hear some of the comments now. Hey, chick, that's speculation. You have only Dr. Rivera's word on that. What proof do you have the Vatican wants to destroy or take over the United States? Well, most of you have never read the great Christian classic, Fifty Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinicky. It was out of print, but we reprinted it at Czech Publications, and believe me, the Jesuits hate this book. I would like to quote the words of Abraham Lincoln regarding the Civil War as found in Fifty Years in the Church of Rome. Quote, this war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of the noblest sons. Though there were great differences of opinion between the South and the North on the question of slavery, neither Jeff Davis nor any of the leading men of the Confederacy would have dared to attack the North had they not relied upon the promises of the Jesuits that, under the mask of democracy, the money and the arms of the Roman Catholic even the arms of France were at their disposal if they would attack us. I pity the priests and bishops and monks of Rome in the United States when the people realize that they are in great part responsible for the tears and blood shed in this war. I conceal what I know on that subject from the knowledge of the nation, for if the people knew the whole truth, this war would turn into a religious war, and it would at once take a tenfold more savage, bloody character. It would become merciless as all religious wars are. It would become a war of extermination on both sides. The Protestants of both the North and the South would surely unite to exterminate the priests and the Jesuits. If they could hear what Professor Morris said to me of the plots made in the very city of Rome to destroy this republic, and if they could learn how the priests, the nuns, and the monks which daily land on our shores under the pretext of preaching their religion, instructing the people in the schools, taking care of the sick in the hospitals, are nothing else but the emissaries of the Pope, of Napoleon, and the other despots of Europe to undermine our institutions, alienate the hearts of our people from our constitution and our laws, destroy our schools, and prepare a reign of anarchy here as they have done in Ireland, in Mexico, in Spain, and wherever there are any people who want to be free." Unquote. And then President Abraham Lincoln went on to say, quote, is it not an absurdity to give a man a thing which he has sworn to hate, curse, and destroy? 
And does not the Church of Rome hate, curse, and destroy liberty of conscience whenever she can do it safely? I am for liberty of conscience in its noblest, broadest, highest sense. But I cannot give liberty of conscience to the Pope and to his followers, the Papists, so long as they tell me through all their councils, theologians, and canon law, that their conscience orders them to burn my wife, strangle my children, and cut my throat when they find their opportunity. This does not seem to be understood by the people today. But sooner or later, the light of common sense will make it clear to everyone that no liberty of conscience can be granted to men who are sworn to obey a pope who pretends to have the right to put to death those who differ from him in religion." Unquote. That, beloved, was said back in the time of the Civil War, and it completely backs up the information Dr. Rivera has given us. Did you hear that? Were you really listening? Did it sink in what President Abraham Lincoln said? Now think back to that interview I had with Dr. Rivera that I told you about on this tape. You've got to understand that when Dr. Rivera was a Jesuit priest under that awful oath and induction, he was in the deepest area of the Vatican's intelligence. He was in the cloak and dagger business for the horror of revelation. Isn't it logical that the Vatican must disavow any knowledge of Dr. Rivera's existence? All intelligence agencies do this to their deep agents. It's common knowledge. What you heard on that interview is what Dr. Rivera received in his Vatican briefing given to him by the Jesuit general on how the Roman Catholic institution plans to take over the United States. Don't you see that Dr. Rivera is bringing forth the same information and it completely backs up and coincides with what Abraham Lincoln said to warn us? And people say the Czech Publications is coming off the wall. While we're sounding the alarm, Rome is pushing as hard as she can in the area of civil rights to block our religious freedom and to stop us from calling her the horror of revelation. Already in Canada, they have banned two of our books, calling them pornography. They'll move heaven and earth to keep this material out of your hands and to keep it from being broadcast. I thank God Dr. Rivera arrived on the scene when he did, because in a few short years, we would have all been muddled. Is what I'm saying thinking in? Beloved, now when you turn on the evening news, you'll see it in a different light because you're going to see the hand of Rome in world politics. Let's wake up, beloved. We're not a bunch of little two-year-olds anymore. Pastors need to wake up. You deacons and church members need to wake up because your kids are going to be destroyed in a few short years if you don't. I'm referring especially to those pastors who are pushing bubbly love to everyone and who turn white and break into a cold sweat when anything controversial comes along. Do you think the priests of Rome respect you for that? Let me tell you, pastors. They hate the ground you walk on and hold you in nothing but contempt. They secretly look at you like scum under their feet. I was recently told that in 1949 an ex-Jesuit priest told a Reverend Eubanks in California that when the Vatican takes control of the United States, every pastor in his family will be shot in the head. You know, we sent a copy of The Godfathers to 100 local pastors. And do you know how many have the courage or the courtesy to respond? Not one. You know, the Bible says that judgment begins in the house of God, and unless we wake up, it's going to happen here. If the pastors are men, then let's act like men of God and start thundering the word of God from the pulpits. The thin line is in the pulpits holding back the forces of hell. Once that caves in, it will be underground churches for America. And then they're going to hunt us down like rats. And they'll show us as much mercy as they did in Yugoslavia. Remember, the priest said it was not a sin to kill a child of seven. Only this time, there will be no United States to defend you. Where are you going to run? To Mexico? It's gone. Canada? It's almost gone. Ireland? Forget it. They're picking it off now. No place to go, beloved. Only to the Lord. The time is running out. We are on a razor's edge. It's time to get on our knees and stop this fooling around and putting on the pious act. If your pastor doesn't have the courage to stand against Rome, you need to make him aware of this information and that it is his responsibility to make his people aware of it too. And if he won't, then you must make the stand. You can now expect to see the supporters of the Vatican start blasting Chinnicky for daring to quote Abraham Lincoln in his book, Fifty Years in the Church of Rome. We're in a war, beloved, and I thank God the Lord has directed us to prepare the ammunition you'll need from Czech publications to give you backup and background. 
And you'll know how to face the lost Roman Catholics after you've gone into prayer. Because if you don't turn into a soul-winning church, the whore is going to have you and your grandchildren for breakfast. Have you already forgotten the screams that filled the night air in Paris during the St. Bartholomew Massacre? Have you forgotten the little pregnant mothers tied to the tree branches begging for mercy in Ireland while the dogs were fighting underneath for their unborn children? And the bloody knives in the hands of those smirking fanatics driven on by their priests to butcher these Christian ladies? Have you forgotten these blood baths that were quoted in Fox's book on martyrs? The Vatican wants you to forget it. Have you forgotten what took place in Yugoslavia? Catholic priests impaling children on stakes as they screamed in agony in 1940? You better never forget it. And don't forget that it was at a time of peace, love, and kindness just before each attack. Just like today, beloved. And don't you forget one million knights of Columbus in the United States have sworn to turn America into a papal state. God help us. You don't think it's coming here? You don't think history repeats itself? It's time to get sober and turn into spiritual soldiers and start arming yourselves with the helmet of salvation and the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, realizing the forces of darkness can be held back. We have a common enemy, beloved. It's time to get back to Christ and start showing mercy and compassion to the precious Roman Catholic people who have been betrayed by their leaders. If we don't, their blood will be on our hands. We must make an effort to win them to Christ. Does this mean our fight is with the Roman Catholic people who have been betrayed by their leaders? No. Our battle is with the whore of Revelation, the mother of harlot and abominations of the earth. God tells us to attack this system. Our job is to rip that mask off her face and let those poor Roman Catholics see that what they're really tied to, the bondage. The fact that they're all going into the lake of fire. They have to be set free. They have to find Christ as the answer. It's not Mary and the rest of the uns unscriptural garbage they throw on them. It's our job to win them to Christ. Beloved, we're not out to please pastors or churches or denominations. We're out to please Christ. We've laid everything on the line. It's his war. It's his battle. He's blessed us. We're doubling the size of our facilities and faith because I know God is raising an army. And we're going to win these precious Roman Catholics. And that's what it's all about. Win these people. Don't throw rocks at them. We're not Nazis. We're not Ku Klux Klaners. We care about these people. And it's not the selfish worldly love being taught so much today that we would rather watch them go to hell than risk offending them with the truth. We put everything on the line to try to win them to Christ, and by God's grace, we will. Catholics are being saved all over this country. In fact, it's getting so big that those in the Vatican are getting worried. Praise God, we now see the light in the tunnel. Catholics are being saved. We hear the rumblings across the country where people are opening their eyes and blinking and saying, Good night, what Chick's saying is true. And they're beginning to read some of these books like The Secret History of the Jesuits and 50 years in the Church of Rome. We're seeing priests and nuns coming to Christ and leaving the Roman system. We've seen the phonies come up, but we've seen the real ones coming out now. There's an upheaval coming, beloved, and it's going to gain momentum. It's time now we got on our knees to be broken before Christ and cry to the Lord that these Roman Catholics get saved. Because it's the power of God that's going to move through us. The fields are white unto harvest. And now is the hour to pick up the gospel and go forward and win these precious souls to Christ. God bless you.